cloud. There we are. Great, thank you. I've also just had two coffees, so I'm a little bit hyperactive. Um, but you'll just have to deal with that. Um, okay, so specialist techniques. Um, a lot of this content was delivered by Michael up until Michael Farrell up until last year. Um, so I've taken over, I've simplified it a little bit, you'd be glad to know. Um, and I've hopefully made it a little bit more understandable um, and taken out a fair bit of the maths, but let's see how you go. We're going to talk about field strength. We're going to talk about MRS, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. We're going to talk about um, DTI, which is diffusion tensor imaging. Okay. We're going to talk about fMRI, which is blood oxygen level dependent contrast. So fMRI, we can call that bold. Okay, blood oxygen level dependent. We're going to talk about perfusion. Okay, so there's five topics that we're going to talk about. And I will... Um, um, I can give you a heads up that there'll be two marks of two of these in the, in the test, okay? So there'll be a short answer questions and two of these four, uh, uh, sorry, um, four of these five topics will be on the test and they'll be worth two marks each, okay? Does that make sense? Um, so four questions, two marks each of the five topics. So the first specialist technique we're going to cover is field strength, okay? So when, when we say field strength, we, took, we talk about 1.5T, we talk about 3T, um, 7T, I think a lot of you guys will be using in your career. It's very exciting. The, the main difference or pretty much the only difference um, between those two in, as far as image quality goes is improving signal to noise ratio. Okay, so we improve the SNR. We don't improve just by going from 3T to, to 7T, we don't improve spatial resolution. Okay, because we know now that spatial resolution is really dependent on the size of the voxels. Okay, so we improve the signal that comes from, that, comes from that, that image. We don't improve the spatial resolution. And of course, if we have the same um, sequence, we can't improve scan time, okay? Because we still have to work out phase encodings, um, NECs and TR, okay? Um, and that's so, so if we have the same sequence, we're gonna get a lot more signal from a 7T than 3T or a 3T from a 1.5T, but um, when we're gonna get the same special spatial resolution and we're gonna get the same scan time, okay, from the same um, parameters. Where we can use that to get spatial resolution and reduce the scan time is we can change that sequence around so that, okay, we let's say we get double um, or we, we get more than double the signal to noise going from 3T to 7T. What about if we say, okay, well, we don't need double the signal to noise. We're actually doing all right as we were. So instead of doing a sequence with two necks, why don't we just do a sequence with one next? We're going to get acceptable signal to noise um, because we've gone from 3T to 7T, and, um, but we're going to get half the scan time perfect okay so we get the same signal to noise and we can do it in half the scan time because we don't need to scan to get extra signal to noise that we would if we were scanning on a three tesla machine okay we can do exactly the same thing now we know with spatial resolution so okay we get enough signal to noise why don't we instead of getting um 256 uh, a matrix of 256 squared or 256 phase encodings, let's double it because we know we get extra signal. We know we can cope with that. So let's double our, our phase resolution up to 256. Okay, so we've doubled our matrix, we've increased our resolution, and we've got much the same signal. 
okay? So we can use those sort of things to increase our um, spatial resolution and our um, scan time or decrease our scan time, okay? But if I ask you what's the benefit in having a 3T versus, in having a 3T versus a 1.5T, then your answer is increased signal to noise. And if you want to give more information, your answer would be, which can be used, increased signal to noise, that can be used to um, make a faster scan or to get increased resolution or um, to get increased contrast, okay? Using the, the concepts that we've talked about in our parameters and trade-offs section. Okay, so we get increased, we also get increased SAR, and I think we discussed, discussed that, or you guys discovered that last year in your ISAP or assignment, where you had, um, because, the, because the frequency was a lot faster in the, um, of the resonant frequency in 3T, then the RF that has to match that resonant frequency has to be a lot faster. We know that if the RF's a lot faster, we get increased SAR, okay? Um, we also get increased noise, but not relevant, or, or not, it is relevant, but not um, uh, in the same capacity, we get more signal than noise, increased noise, okay? And we also get increased artifacts at highest field strength. So things like flow artifacts, we're gonna get them at 1.5. We're also gonna get them at three Tesla. Okay, so no. Um, so we we have to be we have to be cautious of that. Okay. All right. So let's go to our um, T one images. So there's our image, and um, there's our increased um, signal. To to noise ratio, okay? So at 1.5T, 3T, and 7T, we have an increased signal to noise ratio, okay? And you can see that clearly in all your images. All right, so we have bold images, okay? So we also have increased S SNR, okay? We can use that again for resolution, we can use that again for decreased scan time. We also, another point that we get is increased magnetic susceptibility. Okay, so if, if we get, an, if we get a, um, a metal clip in the brain, for instance, um, that's going to show a black hole in the um, 1.5T uh, as, because of magnetic susceptibility, then that's gonna show a bigger black hole in the 3T and an even bigger black hole in the 7T. Okay, so we get anything that causes magnetic susceptibility gets amplified in higher um, Tesla images. Okay, so 1.5 versus 3T, cost benefit. Okay, so we you can imagine that if you have a, um, 1.5 Tesla machine versus a 3T, the 3T is going to be more expensive. Okay, um, twice the field strength, twice the price. Space and shielding. Okay, so we're going to have, it's going to have, need a larger space because we, we call it the footprint. The footprint's going to be bigger at, um, on a 3T versus a 1.5T because it's stronger. It makes sense. Okay. Um, we're also going to have a, the possibility of having a stronger spatial gradient. All right, so you can imagine that spatial gradient has to get from 3T down to 1.5, down to um, say 0.5T, oh, sorry, 3T to 0.5 Gauss or 5 Gauss at the door. Okay, so if, it's, if you compare that to a 7T, then that's going to, that drop off is going to be a lot sharper with a higher field strength. Okay. We also have maintenance costs. So we have, um, we, we, there's more chance of things going wrong 
on a 3T than a 1.5T. And um, uh, clinical utility, utility isn't invariably improved by increases in signal and spatial resolution. Okay, so what, what um, we mean by that is just because you have a 3T, it doesn't necessarily mean it's better. Okay. Um, it's, we, there's studies out there that show that a 1.5T is perfectly capable of acquiring images that, um, or, or getting a diagnosis that um, would, be, would be made using a 3T images. Okay, so they're the main benefits, they're the main factors with, um, high, with high field strength machines. Okay. Any questions? Anything there that um, you might not be sure of? No. Okay. So we're going to we're going to move on to magnetic spectroscopy. Okay. So MRI scanners can be used to estimate levels of molecules. We call them metabolites in the brain. Okay. Electrons in a molecule. So we know we have a nucleus and we have electrons spinning around. Um, effects, so provide a chemical shielding effect that influences the resonant frequency of protons. Um, and we'll see that in the next couple of slides. Shift in frequency are peculiar to individual molecules and the level of a molecule would determine the power of the signature frequency derived from signals measured with MRI, okay? So we're gonna see that in the next couple of slides. So essentially what we see um, is or are metabolites within the brain, within a region, a small region of the brain, okay? So if we pick um, a voxel, we can position that voxel in, a, in um, say a, a, a lesion within the brain and we don't care about the rest of the brain. Okay, we only care about what's inside that voxel. Okay. Um, and then we get a level of metabolites or we get a level of um, different level of chemicals that are inside that voxel, inside a lesion in the brain. Okay, so electrons associated with protons have a shielding effect. Okay, so we know, we can see that an, uh, a proton nucleus, say, let's say hydrogen, we, all, we mostly scan hydrogen. So that nucleus spins, we know the resonant frequency of hydrogen. Okay, we know, um, we've discussed water and, and fats and how water and fat spin at different frequencies. Okay, so they can, and that's depending dependent on the electrons and their makeup, okay? So we have a local magnetic field and we have chemical shift shielding constant by or multiplied by the local or the, the magnetic field experienced by that proton, okay? So chemical shift fielding constant and shifts in the local, whoo, shifts in the sign. Shifts in the local field have a bearing on the resonant frequency of protons. Okay, so, so basically what that means is the frequency of protons is affected by the electrons around it. Okay, and as I say, we see that it, the, the perfect example and the example we've discussed already is the difference in fat and water. Okay, so we know that they spin in a three Tesla machine, they spin at um, 440 hertz difference apart. Okay, and that's what, we, that's what we call and what we've discussed as chemical shift. More electrons, more shielding, less chemical, so less, chemi less chemical shift. Okay. So what we see here is when we have hydrogen protons, we have, um, we have more shielding, or let's say we have um, just hydrogen protons by themselves. Um, we have more 
um, chemical shift. Uh, um, sorry, we have less chemical shift. Okay. We have more shielding. When we increase the number of protons, then we increase the shielding. Okay. So in that case, we have more chemical shift. Okay. So if we have a look at the previous slide, chemical shift shielding constant is up here. Okay. So more protons, more chemical shift shielding constant. Okay, I, I beg your pardon, less, less shielding, chemical shift shielding constant. Okay, so a higher frequency. So signal measured with MRI is a free induction decay. We know that whenever we put a pulse into that um, proton, we get a free induction decay, okay? Um, as the signal dephases and gives off its energy, whether it be to the lattice or whether it be to the spins, it gives off its energy, okay? Free induction decay is measured without associated gradient, which means it does not have positional information. So when we do spectroscopy, we don't have positional information inside that voxel. We only have positional information of that voxel, okay? Increased frequency um, is parts per million. So we use parts per million, and we discuss it in a minute, but we use parts per million to, so as we can compare the spectrum in, um, uh, of 1.5 versus 3 versus 70. So we have a standardised, um, a sta so we have a standardised difference in resonant peaks. Okay. So, we can say that this is hertz. It wouldn't be incorrect to say this is hertz, okay? Or the scale down here is a scale of hertz, okay? But because this is, a, this is um, going to be standardised over different uh, machines and different magnetic field strengths, it's much better to say parts per million, all right? And then we have... Um, the different metabolites or different chemicals that resonate along that frequency. So if this was a frequency, these metabolites, these different metabolites are resonating at different frequencies along this spectrum. Okay. So there's our free induction decay. There's our spectrogram. Okay. And we can see that this peak and this peak are creatine, okay? Because we know the frequency that those, that those um, protons are spinning at, okay? So those, these protons, they're spinning at, let's say, 1.9 parts per million, okay? And we can look over here and we can say, well, at 1.9 parts per million, we know that NAA, n and aspartate, Free, um, resonates at 1.9 parts per million, okay? And we know that because of the uh, um, chemical makeup or the electrons uh, in, its, in its atom, okay, that have affected its, its um, spinning or its resonance, okay? We know that lactate down here, that resonates at 1.25 parts per million. So there's our, there's our lactate peak here. And this is what we get. We get, this, um, we get this spectrogram. So we can break that down into the different molecules. Okay. So we can get, we can quantitate these different molecules inside a voxel. Okay, so now we'll talk about parts per million. So we talk about frequency. We know these molecules are resonating at different frequencies. Parts per million is one in a million, okay? One part per million is one millionth of the Lamar frequency, okay? 
Okay, so now we're talking about the Lamar frequency. We're talking about um, a percentage of um, the, the natural frequency of those metabolites, or those chemicals. Okay. So let's say we want to calculate the chemical shift of fat versus water that we've discussed. The chemical shift we know is 440 hertz at 3 tesla. So we divide it, 440 hertz divided by a million equals 0 0.0044 megahertz. Okay. We divide uh, 0 0.44 megahertz, divide it by the Lamar frequency. One millionth of the Lamar frequency. So we divide it by the Lamar frequency and we get 3.444 parts or parts per million. Okay, so 440 hertz as a proportion of the Lamar frequency is parts per million. All right. Now we know that um, it's the signal that we get, or you could imagine that we, the signal that we get from this free induction decay within a voxel, a small voxel in the brain, this signal will be very small. Okay, we don't have any positional information. We just have a signal that's very, very small. So typically, we have to do that um, average, we have to do that exact same scan 128 or 256 times. Okay, it's exactly like next. The more averages we do, the better the signal. Okay, and you can see that when you're doing a spectroscopy, you can see the signal increasing very slightly each average. Okay, until we get a standout of the curves versus noise excuse me, or versus, other, versus what we call a baseline, okay? So if we took one measurement, we'd see a tiny little blip here where the NAA is. As we take more measurements, we get an increased um, blip or an increased signal. And then once we get 256 measurements, we've got a nice peak here of NAA. Okay, and we can calculate that by NAA is the volume under that peak. Okay. Um, don't stress too much about, um, oh, this is, so this is what we do. So you can see there a voxel. Okay, so we position that voxel in the brain and we usually position it, we can position it any where we usually position it in clinical over, okay? And then we get to find out what metabolites are inside that lesion, okay? And that's called single voxel. So it's called SVS, single voxel spectroscopy, okay? Here we have what's called chemical shift or CSI imaging, okay? And what that is essentially is multiple voxels within that volume, okay? So you can see here afterwards, a bit like a three-dimensional three scan, afterwards you can click on these voxels and you can find out the spectrogram in each of those voxels, okay? So you might have a lesion here over in the chordate nucleus here, then you can find out what the voxels are doing in the opposite side or in healthy tissue over here and here. And you can, you can see whether this lesion has affected the thalamus, for example. Why do we care? Who cares? So you get a spectroscopy. You see that in this case, the lactate peak has elevated. Okay, who cares? What does that mean? Wow. What it means is lactate peak, we see here that the oops, we see here that the lactate peak is elevated. 
We know that lactate is a product of anaerobic gly glycolysis. Okay. In other words, we know that we've all felt lactic acid when we run for the bus or when we do our um, bench press that we all do every day. Um, so we all get lactic acid buildup. Okay, and when the cells are healthy, then we know that the cells can get rid of, can rid the body of lactic acid. When the cells are not healthy, then we, we know when they're dead, we know that we get a buildup of lactic acid. Okay, so we get anaerobic glycolysis that the body can't get away, can't get, can't remove from itself. Okay. We know that that resonates, that peak is at 1.3 parts per million. So if we have a look at here, we know that it's 1.3 parts per million. So it's about here. Okay. So we know that that is lactic acid and we can see that here. Okay. That wasn't the same one. No, well. We can see that here, okay, 1.3 parts per million. And we can see there, we know that's lactic acid because that, there's a, what's called a doublet, okay, or a little twin peak there. And we know that's characteristic of lactic acid. Okay, so of course, if there's brain death, if the body dies, then that peak is huge. Okay, it comes up almost level, depending on, on the the grade or the level of cell death, but that peak can come up as high as the NAA or even higher. Okay, so you put that voxel over a region of cell death, you'd get the spectrogram back and you'd see that they've got an elevated um, lactic acid peak. And you know that that part of the brain where you put that voxel um, is no longer active, no longer viable. So why do we do it? Neoplasms, inherited metabolic disorders, um, leukodystrophy is one that we do, um, that um, we can see the different types of, of what we'd call biomarkers. Okay, I might just go back a little bit and show that we have other, so that was an example of lactic acid. We also have choline, which is present in the cell membrane. Okay, we also have lipids, which is a result of cellular decay. So if we have um, uh, cells that are dying over a period of time, we get a buildup of lipids. Okay, myoinsitol, glial cell marker, glutamate and glutamine are neurotransmitters. Okay, so they help the, the nerves function properly. All right, so... Each of those, we know, I assume we know what a biomarker is, um, an elevated level of something. So we get a blood test, we've got increased sugar in our blood um, or decreased sugar in our blood if you're healthy. And that's a biomarker, okay? So it's something that we can measure that will give them an indication of, of, of disease in the body. Exactly the same here. So it's... So they do a, an MRI scan, they can get a level of the disease that's inside the body. Okay. We can do it in, I've probably, yep. And, and that's pretty much saying the same thing. We can do it in the prostate. Okay, so we get slightly different metabolites in the prostate. We get more lipids because we know we don't have a lot of lipids, if any, in the brain. Um, you can read this. I think I'm just going to summarise it by saying inhomogeneity is in the magnetic field caused by processes other than those at a cellular level will result in a poor or incorrect signal. So we're all, when we talk about spectroscopy, we need to be homogeneous, okay? The field where that pixel or that voxel is must be homogeneous. So if you get any variation in the intensity of that um, voxel, then it's going to affect, it's very, very sensitive. Because when you think about it, we, we are assessing um, the, the frequency of the different metabolites. So we must be absolutely homogenous to, to get any variation in those metabolites 
as a result of the electrons, the electrons around those metabolites. Okay, we must be homogenous. Okay, so we've done 1.5 Tesla. We've done MRS. Are there any questions so far? No? Okay. Now we're going to move on to tractography. Okay, tractography, these pictures, these images are tractography. Okay, they look um, amazing. They, um, are, they are quite useful. That we don't use them as much in clinic, but they are quite useful. Um, we use them a lot in research, okay? Um, and we'll discuss that. So how do we use, and it's very closely related to diffusion weighted imaging that we've discussed, okay? The signal is related to the freedom of, of movement of water molecules. So if the water molecules are free to move around um, the brain, then we're gonna decrease signal. We're gonna get less signal back, okay? If the water molecules are confined to a small space, okay, like we've seen with infarcts, where the cell is dead and the water molecules are trapped inside this dead cell, okay, you're gonna get, start to get signal in that area, okay? If we remember that, characterize, I'm not going to go American. So assessment of water molecules is, is direction dependent, okay? Um, acquisitions can include multiple directions to more comprehensively characterize movement patterns, okay? So in diffusion-weighted imaging, we do three directions. We just do three directions. All right, X, Y, and Z. And that gives us an indication of what the water molecules are doing in the brain. Diffusion tractography, we can use up to 64 or even more. Okay. Um, so water molecules in tissue move in random parts. And this is called Brownian motion. Changes in direction occur when water molecules collide. Thermal energy levels influence the amount of movement in a time period. And this, is rate, this um, rate of movement is, re to a, is referred to as molecular diffusion. I'm having trouble reading today. I think it's the coffee. Okay, so... Um, we know that water molecules move in Brownian motion. They move, they move very random directions. So we can see here, A, these tissue properties can influence molecular diffusion. Constraints lead to a decrease in the amount of molecular diffusion across time. Molecules in A travel further than B before direction changes. It's dictated by the tissue constraint. So it's dictated in this case by the size of the cell inside the body. The bigger the cell, the more diffusion, the more, um, the, the further it goes, the further this particle, this water molecule travels within the cell, okay? So A has an increased mean diffusivity compared to B. Molecules in these two notional environments, or just these two environments, are relatively free to move in any given direction. And they exhibit what's called isotropic diffusion. And we know isotropic is really any direction. So they're not constrained in any one direction, okay? They just move randomly within the cells. What about if we have a cell, we've got our original cell A, what about if we have a cell that's oblong? Okay, um, I'm gonna give you a hint and it's, it's more like a nervous cell in the body. Okay, so the volume of two environments is similar and so too the mean diffusivity of the molecules. The directional preference of movement in B 
can be measured and is referred to as fractional anisotropy. So we know isotropy is the movement in any direction. All right. Fractional anisotropy is preferred movement in one direction. Okay. And it's called FA for short, or fractional anisotropy. So it's not in any direction. It's not isotropic. It's anisotropic. Okay. These two notional environments have different implications for directions of molecule. Movement in molecule A has no, prefer no preference for direction. Movement in molecule B is more likely along the long axis. So that's isotropic. That's anisotropic because you're more likely to get movement along the axis of this cell. Oh, we have a cell, we have a brain cell, okay? Restrictions on the movement of water molecules in the human brain are likely to produce preferential directions of diffusion due to the orderly arrangement of white matter or axonal tracks. Okay, so what it's saying here is we have a cell in the brain. <laughs> in my case, I have a cell in the brain. <laughs> oh dear. I have, um, no, we have. So you have a lot more cells in your brain than I have. The water in your cells is preferentially moving along the direction of the axon. Okay, which means that diffusion is um, fractional, it's anisotropic. Okay, it's not the diffusion of water in that molecule or in this nerve is not free to move in any direction, it will move along the direction of the nerve, it will not move, or it is very unlikely to move across the nerve membrane. Okay, does that make sense? So the water is moving along the nerve. We know that MRI can be used to measure the amount of water molecule movement. Okay, we've seen that in diffusion and we've talked about that in stroke imaging. MRI measures are called diffusion coefficients. We'll talk about that a bit in a minute. And MRI diffusion coefficients are measured along a direction, so one direction. Um, don't worry too much about phase. I think um, uh, suffice to say, location of a molecule in the field influences the strength of the gradient effect. Okay, so which basically says if the if um, the movement of the molecule in one direction is the same as the phase encoding direction, you will get greater um, signal. Okay, application of a phase encoding gradient can cause a phase shift in the frequency of a processing frequency. We know that. Okay, location of a molecule in the field influence the strength of the gradient effect. A molecule that it moves will experience different effects each time a gradius, gradient pulse is applied. So a molecule that is moving in that gradient, in that gradient direction will, will receive, um, will uh, um, exhibit, show a, a phase, changing phase. Okay. And essentially, um, I don't want you to get too caught up in this because it's a little bit tricky. I want you to just get the basic um, application. But essentially, what happens is if we select a phase direction, one phase direction, then we can work out whether that water is traveling in that direction. Okay, because it's going to give back a pulse. Mm. I'm just going to go to this one, this slide, uh, no, not this slide. Um, 
Okay, so if we do, in this case, if we do a gradient in the Z direction, okay, we're gonna get um, a, we're gonna get signal of a water molecule that are traveling in the Z direction. If we put a gradient along the X direction, we're gonna get water molecules that are traveling in the X direction and the Y direction, the Y direction. So there's three directions. If this, if water molecules are traveling from left to right, okay, we're not gonna get a signal here because we haven't got the gradient on in that direction. However, we're gonna get a signal here because the gradient is on from left to right. So any, so any um, water movement in that direction is gonna give us a signal, okay? If, and then if we change direction, so we save that picture, we do another picture and we change direction so that the water molecule is anterior posterior, sorry, the, the diffusion gradient is anterior posterior, then we get a signal in all those water molecules that are traveling in anterior and posterior direction. Okay. And then we change it again and we might go in and out of the, uh, of the, um, the tissue. So now every molecule that's traveling in and out of the tissue will give a, will give signal. Okay. Based on this stuff. So what we're going to do then, if that's the case, why don't we just do 64 images? We can do, and we can change the direction by 360 divided by 64. So we can change the direction. We can do one across here. And then we can do one across here. And then we can do one across here and across here. And so we can change the direction. Every time we change the direction, we get a buildup of signal in that direction. We know which direction we scanned in. We know where that signal um, buildup was. So we can get an image of the difference. We can put that together and get an image of the nervous tracts by assuming that an increase in signal is related to the diffusion of water molecules that's constrained or that's found within the nervous tracts. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? So in doing that, we have, we, we can build up a signal. I know I'm flipping through images. So in doing that, we can build up a signal of, or a, oh gosh, I've lost it now. So in doing 64 directions or 107 directions, um, we did the other day in the research, we can get a, we can get a, um, a map of where these diffusion molecules in this pixel, most of the diffusion molecules were going in that direction because when we put that gradient on, that um, pixel gave a signal. Okay, so, so obviously, okay, well, well, nervous tracts that are going in that direction, they increase their signal. The trouble that we've got is that um, some of these nervous tracts cross. So we're gonna get, we've got to devise ways, and this is advanced, but we've got to devise ways to work out how mathematically, what is actually happening here. Okay, we, we know that we don't have nervous tracts that are always going in the one direction. They, they can cross, okay? So we've got to work out a way, um, MRI, maths, mathematicians have worked out a way of, um, of working that out, basically. The stronger the signal, the more chance that it's going in, the more um, nervous fibers that are going in the one direction. Okay, and the weaker the signal, um, then we only have a few nervous fibers in that pixel that are going in the one direction. Okay. Getting back to our opening slide, we see these pictures here. 
okay? So we know with these red, with the pixels that are, that are traveling um, anterior to posterior, or the, the nervous tracts that are traveling anterior to posterior, will be in green, will be shown green. The nervous tracts that are traveling inferior to superior will be shown in blue. The nervous tracts that are flowing from left to right, as in this corpus callosum, will be, travel, will be um, displayed in red. Okay, so that's why we have these, we have these different colors. It's not just, um, oh, look at science, it can, it can get funny pictures or pretty pictures. Um, these colors actually show us the direction of movement within, um, within the brain. Okay, and so you don't need a three dimensional image, you can just have a two dimensional image. And you can say, okay, well, these are green, that means that those must be traveling anterior to posterior. Okay, and they're very strong, excuse me, which means a bundle of nerves, there's a lot of nerves traveling in this direction. Okay. And that is called a high FA value or a high fractional anisotropy value. Okay, so when you hear of people saying they've got a high FA value, um, it's because there's a lot of nerves traveling in that direction. Okay, so we're talking about blood oxygen level dependent now. So we're moving on. We've talked about um, uh, high field strengths. We've talked about spectroscopy. We've talked about diffusion tensor imaging. Now we're gonna talk about blood oxygen level dependent or bold contrast, okay? So bold contrast is fMRI, it's functional magnetic resonance imaging, and it's mainly used in research. Research uses a lot of functional MRI, okay? Two factors we're gonna think about when we talk about, um, no, we're not. We're going to move on. I'm going to delete that slide because that slide's set. Okay. We think about two things when we talk about fMRI. We think about cognitive brain function and we translate that to behaviour. So we can tell or we can, we can use MRI to tell us what part of the brain is um, functioning. Okay, when we're doing, when we're presenting a, cert, a task to a participant, we can tell, we can find out what part of their brain is functioning when I'm telling, when I'm giving you this information. Okay, if I was having an MRI scan. An example might be if I was um, given a task to remember everyone that I've met in my life. Okay, and I was stuck inside an MRI machine and they were doing a functional MRI of my brain then we know that the hippocampus is the organ or is the structure in the brain that stores memory, okay? If I was to think about everyone that I've met in my life, my hippocampus would be more active than um, my uh, other parts of my brain, okay? So how does that work? How do we get, how can we use that um, or how can we use MRI to get that information? We've got two properties or we've got two principles that we use. We've got um, the physics behind it, okay? That's magnetic properties of the blood we can assess, together with the physiological response of stimulation. So in other words, um, the body's change or the, the, that organ's change, what is that organ doing, that hippocampus doing, that other parts of my brain aren't doing? And how can we assess that? Okay, so let's look at that first. Rather than go to the physics, let's look at the physiological response to stimulation. What's my, what's my hippocampus doing that the other parts aren't? Okay, and this is where um, the process of blood oxygen level dependent comes in. All right, so the signal is dependent on the blood oxygen level. The more, the more blood, 
um, the more oxygenated blood, the higher the signal. All right. So an example is when we, um, we do finger tapping. One of the strongest ways to get an fMRI signal is to tap our fingers. Okay, so we can just tap our fingers in the scanner. While we're scanning, what's happening? We use it, our uh, muscle is using oxygen, okay? More than any other muscle. So my, um, I've got to think about this. Um, my right muscle is using a lot more oxygen, the extensors and flexors in my muscle than my left, okay? I had to think about that because I'm looking at myself which I shouldn't do. That's very vain. Um, so my, my fingers, my extensor muscles are using more oxygen in my right hand than my left hand. Okay. What about, what about my brain? My brain's using more oxygen in the motor cortex than it's using um, in other areas. Okay, my legs, yeah, whatever, it's using the same. Um, my mouth, my face, it's using the same. My fingers, so this part of the motor cortex is doing all the work, okay, when I'm tapping my fingers. So the, blood, so the body's response is to increase the oxygen to that part of my motor cortex, okay? Increase the, the oxygen, You'll, you'll find out in the second part that that increases the signal in the MRI images. The first person to discover this was actually um, Angelo Mosso in 1882. Um, I never was very good at, at history, but I thought this was really interesting. What he did was he put a patient on, the, on a um, very sensitive, balanced table, okay, or a table that was was very sensitively balanced. And what he, what he did was he got the patient to just rest there or the person participant to just rest there. Then he showed the participant some examples or, or got the petition, participant to do some calculations in his brain, okay? When he started to calculate and when he started to get um, emotional or intellectual, intellectual activity within his brain, his head went down, okay? Why? Because blood went up to his brain. Oxygenated blood, in our case, has gone up to his brain to help him with intellectual or emotional activity as he lay on this um, finely balanced table, okay? And the table tipped towards his brain. So that tells us that the more I'm tapping my finger, the more blood, oxygenated blood, goes to the motor, motor cortex, all right? So we have the stimulus at zero, okay? And we're just looking a bit like spectroscopy. We're only looking inside that voxel, all right? Which is quite large, very large in this case. We get an initial dip. Okay, so about, remember, this is five seconds. So it takes about five seconds for that, um, the, body, the body's oxygenation to go down a little bit. You could imagine because all of a sudden, these cells in my brain's motor cortex are working. Okay, so the oxygen's going to go down a little bit. Then my body's going to wake up and go, hang on, they're working. Let's shoot some oxygen, oxygenated blood up. So the amount of oxygenated blood in, my, in that area of my brain is going to increase to a peak, okay? And that's about five seconds after I've started tapping my fingers. Then it starts to wane and it starts to go down and um, it starts to get what's called undershoot. Okay, and that's about 20 seconds after I've initially started tapping my fingers. Okay, so you can see that the functional, uh, sorry, the temporal resolution in this is not overly great. Okay, and have a look at that. You can have a look 
um, we won't go into it in too much depth, but when, when um, you get a chance, have a look at that and see if you can um, follow the heavy line. So you've got neuronal act, um, activity, finger tapping, glucose and oxygen metabolism. We're, more, we're just worried about oxygen metabolism. Cerebral blood flow to that area, blood oxygenation, Magnetic field uniformity, okay, because of what we'll talk about in a minute. And then we've got decay time, and then we've got increase in two to star signal. So it's brighter. Okay, so that's all because of the biological processes or the bold effect. Now we're going to talk about physics. We love that. Physical. Um, or magnetic properties of blood, okay? So we know, um, before we start, we know ferromagnetic has strong magnetic susceptibility, ferromagnetic particles. Paramagnetic has weak magnetic susceptibility. And diamagnetic, eh, they've got a small amount of repulsion. So hemoglobin, or deoxyhemoglobin, more importantly, is paramagnetic or it's weak magnetic susceptibility. Okay, so it disturbs the magnetic field a little bit. And what we know that when um, the magnetic field is disturbed, we get an increase in T2 star. Uh, we get a decrease, I'm sorry, when the magnetic field is disturbed, we get a decrease in T2 star. Okay, which means that we've got a magnetic field that's homogeneous, then it gets disturbed, all those spins are flipping, they're not dephasing um, and then rephasing together as they normally should. They're dephasing and they're, they're dephasing more because the field isn't homogeneous. Some in that area are experiencing more. Um, magnetic field in homogeneities, a weaker field, the ones next to it are a stronger field, is eventually they're not going to rephase properly like they should, as they would in a uniform magnetic field. Okay, so again, we've discussed this. In that case, because the magnetic field is altered because of this blood, okay, then we've got a weaker or we've got decreased T2 signal or grade, the T2 star signal in a gradient echo sequence because it's gradient echo, it's T2 star. Okay, so if we've got a weaker, if we've got a bleed here, we've got a paramagnetic substance that's interrupted the magnetic field and that interruption has dephased those protons. Okay, because those protons in there are experiencing a different magnetic field caused by the iron. All right, that's been exposed and it's not shielded by oxygen. It's a bleed, it's deoxygenated iron. Oxyhemoglobin, on the other hand, oxygenated iron is a diamagnetic substance. Okay, and it has negligible magnetic susceptibility. So haemoglobin in the brain creates a small intrinsic artifact. Because of the iron in the haemoglobin, you're gonna get a small intrinsic susceptibility. Oxygenated iron is shielded. So magnetic, magnetic susceptibility is decreased, means it's diamagnetic or decreased artifacts, which means increased signal. Okay, so that's how the, that's the physics behind it. And hopefully you can understand what we've been saying with the susceptibility weighted sequence, that when you have a bleed, that iron becomes exposed. So it loses its oxygen, okay? We know that deoxygenated iron becomes, um, uh, because it's only got one um, or unpaired electrons, it becomes it becomes paramagnetic. Okay, so the magnetic field isn't uniform. 
we get an artifact. Oxygenated, which is happening here, the oxygen um, combines with that iron, so it's, so it's um, instead of having a um, unpaired electron or four pairs of unpaired electrons, as in ions, the oxygen shields those unpaired electrons. So it becomes diamagnetic and it gives a signal. Um, I'm not going to test you on um, the, the types of fMRI experiments. Um, basically, the yellow is finger tapping, the pink is resting. Okay, so what's happening is as the patient's finger tapping, those signals are cumulative. So the signal actually increases over periods of finger tapping versus periods of rest. Okay. And there's two types of designs, block designs, event related designs. Again, I'm not going to test you on these. Suffice to say, to say that the um that the signal is cumulative so you don't just get a signal that's equal to this stimulus you get a signal with these stimulus um added up okay don't stress that's block designs are quite easy um but have disadvantages they don't have a mu as much information on offer event related designs each Stimulus is different, so you might be presented with a maths equation, for instance. Each um, stimulus is different, so every time you do that, you have to, um, you get tiny signals. Okay, so you have to repeat that, just like MRS and everything else, you have to repeat that over and over and over again until you get great signals, okay, or signals that actually stand out. Who cares, who cares? So clinical fMRI. So we're gonna do an fMRI on this patient with a great big tumor, okay? We're gonna see that this is the motor cortex. We, he's tapping his fingers while we do fMRI. We've got no idea where the motor cortex is in this participant or patient, patient, okay? So if we get him to tap his fingers and we do an fMRI, by the processes that I've explained, we're gonna get enhanced regions where he's, um, that are active, okay? And so in research, and in research, we can work out, we can present all different patients with all different types of stimulus to work out what's happening with drugs in the brain, what's happening with physiology, molecular biology, psychiatry, and, and psychology. Okay, they all have, pla have places, or fMRI has places in all of these fields. Um, I'm running out of time, but I would like to show you this example. It's called neurofeedback, and the patient is lying in the scanner, and they're, they're watching this movie, okay, or this game. What we, what we're telling them to do is just, um, when they feel bad piano music, okay, we want them to become angry. And we want the, the part of the brain that becomes angry, how could you not be angry listening to that music, okay? The more that part of the brain that's getting angrier, the darker this pitch is going, All right? And the machine's working that out as we're scanning, so it's real time. It's like my piano. The patient's getting angrier and angrier, and the machine has seen that the angry center in their brain is is working more and more and so it's displaying that it's getting darker and darker neutral and now we're going to play proper um piano music and the patient's going to be happy other centers the happy 
centers in the brain are going to enhance. Okay, they're gonna get more oxygenation. Um, we're gonna get more signal in those areas. The patient um, is going to get, um, it, it, the presentation of that will be that the, the, the um, game gets brighter, or the picture gets brighter. The last one we're going to um, do as far as specialist techniques is ASL, okay? And basically what ASL does is it puts a tag or it tags these pulses around the neck, okay? And then it listens to that tag as this blood travels up the brain, okay? So it tags these pulses. These pulses are spinning, will spin at a different um, phase. And then it will listen up here. So pulses that make it up through the circuitry system and, and come into this tissue are spinning at different phase than um, pulses that are in stationary tissue. And we know, hopefully, we've seen perfusion in CT and maybe MRI. So the faster um, the pulses come up, uh, and then we do a number of signals. We do a number of tags and listen, tags and listen, tags and listen. If the signal, if the blood comes into this region in delay, okay, then it means that um, there's going to be a pathology or there's some sort of delay causing that blood going to the perfusion. We say pathology, okay, a tumour, we know the tumour. Um, the blood will get to the rest of the brain okay, but the tumour, it will be a lot slower. So if we can see that the tagged blood down here gets to a tumour that's in this slice slower, okay, or it takes longer, it will, be, it will be tagged rather than the healthy tissue you'll see in about, so let's say, I don't know, three seconds after the tag, the tumour might be four or five seconds after the tag. Okay. We have two types. We have pulsed arterial spin labeling and we have continuous uh, arterial spin labeling. So we have a continuous tag here and listen and listen and listen, or we have a pulse tag here and then listen and listen and listen. Another pulse tag. Listen, listen, okay? Then we have, we subtract the image of the, the tagged image from the untagged image. And then we're left with just the, the um, signal from the tag, which is from the carotid arteries going up into the brain, okay? So be careful, it's not an angiogram because we're not looking at those carotid arteries, we're looking at the perfusion of that blood into the tissue, okay? There's a bold and there's cerebral blood flow. Okay. And again, we have to do that multiple times. Tumours, um, we know have delayed uptake of blood. Ischemic stroke has a delayed uptake. And we would prefer to give gadolinium, but it's not always, um, it may be contraindicated in some people as we've, dis as we've discussed, okay? And also we do it in research. We do a lot of ASL in research and we can't give gadolinium in research. All right. Okay, so the field strength of MRI scan is an, is an important factor in determining image quality. 
MRI can provide measures of chemical content of tissues, the magnitude and principal directions of water diffusion in tissues, hemodynamic responses in association with tissue function and levels of perfusion. The diverse parameters measured with MRI continue to, go up, to undergo developments which are likely to lead to translations in clinical practice. This is, this is an important part of MRI, okay? Translation of these type of techniques into clinical practice. So we have a um, biomarkers, all right? We can do a functional MRI scan and we can see, okay, there's activation in this part of the brain um, when we're giving the stimulus, in which case that person is more likely to develop schizophrenia or some sort of post-traumatic stress or some sort of reaction as part of that. And in, I think in your careers, it's gonna be very, very exciting, the types of scanning that we can do. All right, it's just clicked over to 2.15. Um, so we're doing quite well. Um, I'm going to stop screen share. I'm going to give you guys a rest for five minutes. More importantly, give me a rest for five minutes. Okay, you can all see my PowerPoint, okay. Can someone see my PowerPoint and hear me? Yeah, all good. Excellent, okay. All right, so we're gonna talk about PET MRI now. We're gonna talk about um, MRI and uh, what we call hybrid imaging. So hybrid imaging is really multiple modalities combined into one machine or one um, modality, okay? Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna touch on the challenge, we're gonna touch on revision of PET, so, or, or really um, nuclear medicine. What is nuclear medicine and why is it, um, how is it important? And it is very important. What's hybrid imaging? Some of the hardware that we use in MR PET, modified techniques, um, We've got some happy snaps of MBI across the road um, from you guys. We've got some workflow um, snaps and, and a research case study that I think I've deleted, um, but we'll think about it. Um, now, uh, I was gonna say something, but I can't remember. Oh. So basically we've got a little child here. Okay, everyone can see this little, um, Wally, what about when we put it in black and white? We don't see it as well, okay? No, it's not in it. We don't see him as well, okay? And that's really what radiology is. So radiology, we're looking for Wally in that, a grown-up Wally in that, in that uh, picture. We can't see it very well, okay? What about if we shine a light on Wally? All of a sudden, we see it very well. Okay. Um, oh, just take a step back. I know what I was going to say. This PET MR is worth 10 marks in your, on your um, exam. Okay. So it'll be, I think from memory, it's five questions worth two marks, but we will go over the format next week um, in the revision session. Okay. Um, so we have a T2 um, fat sat image, okay? We can't see a lesion there in the spine. And radiologists are known for pretty much looking at an at a image and saying, um, uh, for about three seconds. They'll scan it for three seconds and then they'll move on, okay? Which is the studies have been shown that that's pretty much what happens. Okay, in this case, we can see that there's a tumour or some sort of lesion down here, okay, in the PET study. We know, and we haven't seen it in any of the different weightings in MRI, all right? We've only seen it in our PET scan, okay? 
Now we know PET is a nuclear medicine and we know nuclear medicine studies um, uh, metabolic activity. Okay, so the, our classic example um, is that if we go, if we go back and say, um, when I'm tapping my fingers, okay, not only is my forearm extensors and flexors using oxygen, they're also using glucose, all right, to, to do that energy. So if we inject the body with glucose, then those tendons and those muscles will be uptaking the, glu the glucose, okay? They'll take up the glucose and they'll store that glucose and they'll use that glucose when I'm tapping my fingers, okay? Not just oxygen, glucose. So who cares? We can't see that. No matter what we do, we can't, the glucose that we've injected, we can't see that being taken up in my forearm. Okay, unless we combine that glucose with a molecule of radiation. Okay, so a glucose molecule, a molecule of radiation, okay, then we can follow exactly where that glucose goes in the body. More glucose goes to this muscle, we're going to get a PET signal from that muscle. Okay, increase in radiation. Um, from this muscle because that radiation has been attached to a glucose molecule that's going to go to this muscle. So we're going to have, when we do a scan, you're going to see an increased uptake of glucose within my muscles, okay, or within this muscle, the muscles in my forearm. Same thing is happening in this lesion. We can't see any structural abnormality on our MRI scan, but this glucose molecule has gone to an area that's, up, that's using more energy than anything around it, i.e. it's a tumour. The tumour is using more energy, okay? The energy that we've injected has been bound or combined with a radioisotope. So if we put a detector there, we'll get a hot spot because we can see this radioisotope because it's gone, more of that substance has gone to the tumour than to the lungs or to the liver or anything else like that, okay? Well, obviously we can see it in the kidneys because it's been excreted, okay? So we'll see increased radiation in the kidneys because the kidneys are excreting that glucose. Not because they're using it necessarily, but because they're excreting it, okay? So that's called metabolic activity or functional activity. And that's what nuclear medicine does very, very well. Not just glucose, but they also use other molecules. They can inject other molecules like a bone scan. They can inject, say, osteoblasts or whatever they call them and bind them with radiation so that when the body tries to repair itself, it uses more of those chemicals, okay, or more of those metabolites or... or um, I don't want to say chemicals, uses more of those cells. And then because they're binding with radiation, you can see in the body where there's a subtle fracture because they've uptaken those, um, those drugs or those um, molecules to help the body repair themselves. Okay. How does PET work? PET has a ring of detectors, the same as MRI okay, or inside the MRI ring of detectors. So there's a, um, po a positron emitting nucleus. So the positron emitting nucleus emits a positron, it travels a short distance, and then it emits two electrons. It explodes and emits two electrons at about 180 degrees opposite. One goes one way, the 180 degrees goes the other. Okay, then this is called a line of response. So if at exactly the same time or very, very nano nanoseconds, the detectors detect a, a, a signal here and a signal here, they know that something is happening along that line of response. Here and here, they know something's happening along that line of response. 
okay? And then of course, a bit like CT or very similar to CT, they can narrow down where that um, lesion's coming from. There are two times, so positrons emit nucleus that are 511 kilo electron volts, okay? So they detect um, electrons that are 511 kilo electron volts. Um, okay, so that's a very basic of how it all works. Um, I've mentioned that the PET signal, it can offer uh, metabolism of, say, the glucose. It can measure blood flow. It can measure neurotransmitters. If we inject neurotransmitters and combine those drugs with radiation, okay, so we can see what parts of the brain are using those neurotransmitters and are, and are therefore more active, okay, and label drugs, all right. An example that I used was glucose. It's called fluorodeoxyglucose or FDG, okay? And you'll hear that quite a bit if you're around nuclear medicine. An example of hybrid imaging is CT PET, MRI PET, SPECT CT, SPECT MRI, da 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 da. Any, um, any modality that uses one, that uses two or more, or one or more other modalities. Okay. It leads to individualized medicine. So we can tailor this test towards patients. Reduced exposure to ionizing radiation. So if you have a patient with cancer, let's say it's a three-year-old, you don't want that three-year-old to keep coming back and back every three months to have a CT scan. Okay. So what you can do is you can have an MRI scan um, and PET. So I'll take a step back. You don't want to have that patient come back. Um, in fact, I'll take two steps back. A PET scan, and this is an important point, a PET scan is this PET scan, okay? We don't get anatomic information from, from a PET scan. We only get metabolic information from a PET scan, okay? Which is why we must use either a CT scan or an MRI scan to get our anatomic information and then superimpose it. You get a signal here, exactly where that signal's coming from, we don't know, okay? Is it in the cortex of the bone? Is it in the, um, is it in the fatty substance in the bone? Is it in the disc, a, a corner of the disc? We don't know. Okay, so you need MRI and CT to localize, to provide anatomic information as to exactly where that nucleus or where that signal is coming from. Okay, so when we talk about um, our three year old um, with a lesion, okay, we don't want to give them, we need a PET scan. We don't want to give them a PET CT scan every three months because that's going to increase their radiation, their level of radiation. So we're going to give them a PET MR scan so they have a small amount of radiation, relatively small amount of radiation, and they have an MRI scan every three months rather than a CT scan. So over the years, when that person, when that child becomes 20, 30, even older, their radiation exposure will be dramatically reduced because they won't have had to have an CT scan every three months. We have an increased accuracy of diagnostic imaging. Okay, so we know last lecture we saw how much information we can get from diagnostic from MRI scans. Okay, so we can have we can tailor that to the patient. And as a, re as a result, we have re reduced delay for diagnosis and subsequent therapy. It's faster. We have a lesion. We need to get that diagnosed so as the patient can be, um, begin treatment as soon as possible. Okay. So decreased dose. Also research cases. We can't do research with CT scan. We can't get ethics. And we don't want to. We don't want to blast people with CT scan radiation. Okay, for no reason. 
So we use MRI scan. We have a very small dose and that's controlled by ethics. Okay. Um, but it's important, it's, um, it gives us a lot of information about the functioning of the, of the different um, systems in our, brain, in our body. We have excellent soft tissue contrast with MRI, and we have what's called multi-parametric, okay? And that should be including fMRI. So what multi-parametric refers to or means is we have different types of tests. We have T1, we have T2, we have functional, we have ASL, we have DTI, da 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 da. We have all these different types of tests that we can combine with our PET imaging. Okay. A one stop shop decreases pathology, uh, decreases repeated visits for many pathology, and a decrease in treatment time. Okay, and some really good articles if you're interested. Professional and credentials. So some of the challenges. We need two professions to run one magnet and one PET MR magnet. Okay, and we must use both specialities. Okay, so we need radiographers. We need, we need nuclear medicine technologists. We also need doctors that are trained to view both modalities, okay? We can have separate doctors for the separate modalities, but it works a lot better if doctors are trained in MRI and trained in, in nuclear medicine and PET, okay? Which makes sense. Clinical workflow um, and optimizing scan protocols is important. How do we do it on what patients is, is important? We know the machine is very costly. We know we don't have any, any um, we know we don't have any uh, reimbursements in Medicare. Okay. Attenuation correction, co-registration. So um, we're gonna talk about attenuation correction. We're gonna talk about marrying the images up. So co-registration means we have an image here, okay, and we use a CT or an MRI scan, how do we um, match those two up? We don't want to have um, an MRI scan that's not at the same position uh, as CT, as the PET scan. Okay, so registration of the image. Um, and we have different artifacts. Of course, we have different artifacts because we have two modalities. Regulatory requirements, obviously they've got to be monitored. We have risks and safety considerations of both modalities. So trying to put that together is going to be double and we must compare the effectiveness. Which disease is best on which, with which modality and which disease would be benefited by, um, by combined modality. Three types of MRI systems, MRI PET systems. We have sequential, back-to-back, -back, okay? So we have a PET and we have an MRI system, okay? So we know we can do the PET scan, we can move the patient uh, um, 500 five meters or whatever it is, and we scan the patient using MRI. We know exactly how to marry those two up, okay? We have inserts. So we have, um, we can get an MRI scanner and we have a PET insert inside that bore of the MRI scanner, okay? Obviously that's primarily good for heads, small patients or small, very small patients. Or we have a fully integrated system, okay? So we have the PET detector inside a large scanner. Of course, we have problems um, where we can't just put a PET system into a large scanner, okay? Obviously, that strong MRI system is going to play havoc with the PET components. Obviously, the PET components 
are going to play havoc with our MRI system. Okay, so we've got some special challenges here. The first, um, the first um, way to get around those challenges was put, to put detectors inside the machine and then have optical fibres coming out through and then into collecting or, or diodes, photodiodes we'll call them, out here. Okay, or photomultiplying tubes that were MRI sensitive. The trouble with that, uh, I've put this in just to show you how the thinking behind it, but the trouble with that is that we lost a lot of signal between those two, or they lost a lot of signal between those light guides or the optical fibres. Okay. Don't worry too much about this stuff hardware in so much as um, uh, photosensitive things. I won't, I'm not going to be testing you on solid state detectors. They're not going to be in the test. Okay. Um, and I'm not even going to worry about basic roll of them. Suffice to say, it's a PET detector. Okay. So, Moving on, attenuation correction, okay? So this is important and this is, will be on the test. We've got a PET signal in here from the heart, okay? So we've got a radiation signal we know has come 180 degrees and been detected, all right? Can we compare that detection from the heart? So that signal has gone through the lungs and being detected on the outside by the ring detectors. Can we compare that signal, okay, by a signal, let's say from the bladder, that it hasn't traveled through air, it's traveled through bone, okay? So it's traveled through bone, it's been attenuated and a lot less signal has come out from the bladder to be detected, okay? So a non-attenuated image, we can see here, a lot less signal has come out from the bladder than through, um, through the lungs. We've got a lot of signal here, okay? And as a result, we've got a decreased signal in this area, okay? So what we have to do is we have to say, okay, if we can get some MR, or if, let's say CT, if we can get some CT information, about these bones and this soft tissue, we can work out the likelihood or how much this has been attenuated, the radiation from this bladder has been attenuated. And so we can correct for that, okay? And so we can have a standardized model where maybe we can reduce the signal from the heart because we know a lot more has come out through the lungs relative and increase the signal or increase the signal relative to the signal in the, in the bladder, okay? Okay, we've got 50% of the bladder. We know that only 50%'s got to that detectors through the bones, so we're gonna double that signal around that area, okay? And CT's very good at that because CT uses radiation, so it has a better idea, not exactly because it uses different energy of radiation, but it has a better idea of how these, um, of the attenuation factors around this bladder. Okay. So what's the difference between a non-attenuated image and attenuated image? Firstly, um, look at the midline is void of counts on Non, on attenuated, non-attenuated image. We've got decreased counts in the midline because all these counts, even though there's been a lot, they've all been attenuated or, or a lot of them has been attenuated on their way to the detector, okay? On the other hand, skin uptake, we've got quite a large signal of skin because a lot of those have not been attenuated, okay? And we've also got to think about breathing. So this, this scan would have been applied over a couple of minutes at least. So we know this lesion is, I think this lesion is in the um, liver, but we can see because of the breathing, it appears to be in the lungs. Okay. 
So we've got to look at the non-attenuated image to see that's going to help us decide where exactly where that lesion is. Okay, don't worry too much about that. Um, suffice to say, it is important that we do attenuation, um, especially if we're going to quantitate this or get any um, measurements of how much radiation comes out. We can't measure it if we don't know what structures are around it. Okay, And it's not like x-ray where, okay, you're doing a lateral hit, shoot through. You can just increase the energy of that beam because it's got more to go through. Okay, we can't do that here because, as I said, these photons come out at 511 electron volts. All right, so we can't increase the energy, we can't change the energy depending on what's around it. We can get quantitative PET imaging, as we said, we can work out the value of what's being emitted. And um, we can also increase the sensitivity with enhancing structures, all right, using attenuation correction. So how do we get that? How do we know how to get, uh, how do we know what structures are around it? Essentially, we're going to get um, images that are very good at displaying bones, okay? So we have soft tissue, we have bone, and we have air, okay? So we do what's called, we have a type of image, and don't worry about what's called, but we have a type of image that's very good, or a type of sequence, an MRI sequence. Um, I mentioned PET scanning is very good at getting attenuated corrected images. Okay, or working out the attenuation correction because it uses radiation. However, MRI is not so good because we don't use radiation. We have to assume the values using other techniques. One of the techniques, as I started to say, was a ute sequence, ultra short TE, which helps us get the bone, the soft tissue and air. And that's really all we need to get attenuation correction. So the, so the mathem mathematicians are able to work out how um, a, a radiation molecule can be um, emitted within that area or within that volume, okay? That's mainly for the brain. In the, in the rest of the body, we use in-phase and out-of-phase images, okay? So it's called Dixon, and we've talked briefly talked about that in the liver. But basically what we get is um, images that displays, or we can differentiate between fat and water. Exactly in the liver, we can differentiate between lesions that are fat or lesions that are primarily composed of water. Okay, and we mentioned that in active scanning in the liver. Exactly the same. So all we read, need to know in attenuation correction is fat, where fat is, where water is, and where bone, um, where bony structures are, which you can deduce from the fat. Okay. We'll get air in Dixon, fluid, fat, and soft tissue, all of which can be displayed in Dixon imaging. And we get what's called a mu map. Okay, I think it should be just you, but someone will always put an M in front of it. I don't know why. But essentially what that does is that gives us attenuated, corrected, um, or, or a map of the bones and the soft tissue. Okay. We can also get an atlas. So we can also just get 100 people's MRI scans or 1,000 people's MRI scans and we can compare and we can see, uh, again, the mathematicians can find, um, get templates of people's brain. What does it look like? They could do a CT scan of these 1,000 people or get data from an MRI scan, get data from a CT scan and marry them up and then they can work out the attenuation um, factors by the MRI scan, okay? 
But that's very difficult because if you've got a patient and a lot of these patients have different lesions in their brain, you've got to get all these different maps with different types of lesions, okay? And it's very, very difficult. So you can't just get, um, you can't just get a normal atlas to help with attenuation correction, okay? And you can also get PET emission data. So you, you can put PET sources inside and inside while you're scanning the patient. And if you know exactly what PET sources you've got and then the radiation coming from the PET sources, then you can deduce how much radio, how much attenuation is happening. Okay, so there's the three main things to help get attenuation correction. Um, and that article might be good to read um, when you're studying, uh, even just the front page or the introduction, give you a couple of pointers. Now we've got stuff that we've also got to, to think about, well, the, pa the patient's inside this scanner and radiation's coming from their head and it's being um, absorbed or being detected by the PET detectors, okay? What about the equipment? We can't use a normal head coil that we would use in a normal MRI scan, okay? We've got to use a specialised head coil to maximise the MRI signal, but also minimise the um, absorption or attenuation of the PET signal, okay? That's one factor. Another factor is that this has to be um, the, the, um, oh my gosh, I forgot what I was going to say. The, anything that we use for the pet, um, and any, any positioning pads and anything like that, we have to make sure that they don't attenuate the pet signal as well. Okay. So certain things, certain pads or certain structures may not attenuate the MR signal, but they will attenuate the PET scan. Okay, so the coils that we have are all MMR, multimodality um, MRI scan. Okay. Okay, so we we also have other um, we also have other things. So we have um, radiation. We have to think about radiation. Okay, we have to think about absorption and, and the PET side of things. Sponges and supports, radiation shielding in and around the room. So we must get, not only do we have our Faraday cage to stop radio frequencies getting into the room, we also have lead lining in those walls to stop radiation getting out of the room. Okay, even though yeah, this patient's inside there, or this patient's inside there having a scan, they're radioactive, okay? So we can't be close to them for any length of time. So we don't have a little window. Well, we have a little window, but we can't have a big window. No, I'll take that back. We can have a big window, but it's got to be lead lined and it's got to be radio frequency um, shielded. Okay, so and that was going to be very, very expensive. So instead, we put cameras inside the room and we can see on television screens. Okay, and they're absolutely fantastic. You can see right up close to the patient. Okay, so that's only because we can't have a window um, or anything that we have there must be lead lined and must be radiation shielding and it was very expensive. We know that the, radio, that the nuclear medicine technologists have to go into the room to give their um, radiation dose while we're scanning in a lot of cases. They can give it outside or in some trials, some scans, they have to go in and they have to give it while they're in there. We know that um, if they can't get out of the, that if they open the door to get out, they're gonna open that shield. Okay, so we're going to have RF coming from the lights going into the room and being detected by the camera. So what we have is we have two doors. We have this door, outside door closed when they're inside. They can open this shielded door, come in here to the middle, close that shielded door, 
and then open this shielded door and then close this shielded door. So there's an RF lock at all times. Okay. There's uptake rooms. So sometimes we give the patients um, radiation. We let them wait for maybe a half an hour or an hour until that radiation goes through their body and collects in the organs that we want it to collect in. And then we do the scan. And we're nearly done in that we have a PET detector position inside at the ISO center. Okay, so it is truly, um, uh, oh, I've forgotten the word, simultaneous. Okay, so we can get MRI scans and PET scans at exactly the same time. Okay, so that shortens the time that the patient has to be in there. And also, if we're giving them bold um, stimulus, we can have a look at what their oxygen's doing, excuse me, and glucose is doing in their brain at exactly the same time. Okay, and it's very, very, it's a perfect research tool. This slide just shows you um, the uh, green sequence is the PET sequence, and the white sequence is the MRI sequence. Okay, and you can see that they're going at exactly the same time. And then we'll just do the PET sequence might go for um, a half an hour, 30 minutes, let's say. So the PET detectors are going to be on for 30 minutes while that patient's inside the machine. Okay, and then meanwhile, we'll do that one, and then we'll do that sequence, and then we'll do that sequence, and then we'll do that sequence. All the while, we're getting PET information. From that patient's brain. And there's three people that have helped me put this talk together and that I've worked with very, very closely over the years, and they are amazing. Any questions? Anything? We've had a, a quite a long session today, um, and I'm tired. So I don't imagine how, I can't imagine how tired you are. Is there any questions that anyone's got? Does anyone want to have a talk about anything? Um, next week, I think it's Tuesday, we'll be talking about the test. Um, is there anything that anyone wants to bring up um, outside of Tuesday? Um, um, hi, Richard's Bridget. Hi, Bridget. Hi. Um, so yeah, we've got a week until that session. Um, mm -hmm. I was just wondering in the meantime, what we should focus our revision efforts towards. Just a bit of advice for that, maybe. Um, I think it probably depends on everyone's individual, but probably maybe, um, well, the, the questions, there's going to be, we're going to go through the tests um, or through the um, questions next Tuesday. Um, I guess if you're, it, it's going to be, um, there's going to be three tests. There's going to be a written test um, on safety. Perhaps you could start looking at the safety. Um, if that's what you wanted to, you can start your revision. Um, Failing that, you could start, um, you could uh, have a look at this content, the content that we've done today, maybe work backwards when it's still fresh in your mind. Um, uh, so, or you could start um, looking at the anatomy structures um, and the, the same structures that you've learned the last couple of years, but just they'll be on the test as well. Um, so yeah, it's really up to you guys as to what, what you think is best. Um, I'm going to stop recording now.